Welcome back to A Beer in Business. I am privileged this week to have Michael Petacolis with me of the Petacolis Brewing Company here in Dallas, Texas. At Beer in Business, we love to give entrepreneurial tips, and it just so happens we're gonna be getting tips today from a guy that makes beer. But first, you know what we got here? Oh, I didn't yes. tell you coming in, this is your golden opportunity. I love so it, I appreciate salute it. You. Few things I like drinking beer more than drinking my own beer. So thanks for there pouring it, Tom. I'm excited to be here, this is gonna be great. We're just happy to have you and really appreciate it. And I'd like to start with, why don't you tell me just a little bit about the Golden Opportunity and what led you to this particular recipe? And then let's talk about your company. Sure, absolutely, Golden Opportunity. So when I started the brewery, I really became known very early on for making these high alcohol beers that don't necessarily come across as high alcohol, but I wanted something that I could get to the non-craft beer drinker, someone that was a Bud Miller Coors guy, something that looked like something that they would recognize, but definitely tastes a whole bunch better and smells a little bit better or actually a lot better as well. Something that they could immediately identify with, understand, hey, I've had this before, and now let me delve into this world of craft beer. So this is kind of the gateway beer, right? Very delicate, very crisp, very light, little bit of hot bitterness to it, just a tad bit of sweetness to it, but easy drinking. One of those beers that I say you could drink 10 of when it's 110 degrees outside. You know what I love about what you just said is you took an entrepreneur's perspective to talk about the beer, and it shows you about the passion you have to have as a product, whether you're making beer or you're making social media software, it doesn't matter what you're doing, you gotta have passion for your product. And you got into business after your mom, Jackie, in El Paso first created it. So why don't you share with us how your mom got into it and then your decision to take the entrepreneurial walk with your mom and the family brewing business. Yeah, happy to do that. I mean, I came home from college one summer and my mom, who pretty much a chef, I mean, not a professional chef, but all our life, I mean, this, this lady could cook and brewing beer is really an extension of, of cooking, but I come home and um, she sits down these two big brown bomber bottles and gets a couple of glasses and gets a bottle opener and pssst, you know opens up this bottle. I'm like, well, what is this? And she goes, well, I made beer. I'm like, well, you made beer? What do you mean you made beer? But you know, she pours us out this nice light Mexican ale and we go out on the back porch, her back porch in El Paso where you can overlook Texas, New Mexico and Mexico. And we're drinking that beer. And you know, that's when it really hit me that man, okay, she's made something that tastes better than what you can get down the street. And the experience of drinking a beer that someone I knew made, and in this case, my mom, that was my first exposure to homebrew. And that's kind of one of the things that lit this fire about, mm, hey man, my, I've got a passion for beer and maybe we'll do something with this in the future. And what led you to take the entrepreneurial step and say, okay, mom, I'm gonna run the business and I'm gonna do this. Well, I had practiced, I'm also a lawyer and I practiced law for about a decade. I came across a list of goals that I put together for myself to accomplish in the legal industry. And this was about 10 years, this was in 2010. And as I was going through this list, I realized oh, I've accomplished everything on that list I had already accomplished. And I'm not someone who can just go through the motions. I really was, was looking for a challenge and I have two passions in life, beer and soccer. And I decided, you know what, what better thing to do than make one of my passions, my job, investigated how to write a business plan, wrote the business plan all throughout 2010 and then ultimately built a brewery in 2011. That's fantastic. And I noticed that the logo for the brewery is very familiar to me, but I'll let you tell people the inspiration for that logo? Oh, the logo has, you know, quite a bit going on into it. You know, one thing I wanted to create a mark that didn't exist in the marketplace, right? You, you see Nike swoosh and you automatically know that's Nike. You see Under Armour's UA, you know that's Under Armour without any reference to Under High Armour. High recognition identity. Yeah, that's right. So I wanted to create a mark that did not exist in the marketplace. So that central little interlocking B and P and C was a mark that I could identify our brewery on its own, right? So that in years we can just basically use just that and it would say the same thing as if we were had that central image with Pedicles brewing company around it but I also again going back to my love of soccer I wanted it to look like the crest on a footballer's jersey and so I kind of designed it and borrowed from like uh, other football organizations that use the initials of their organization in their logo so I definitely incorporated that I incorporated the shape of the state of Texas because our three corporate values are honest friendly and down to earth. The state motto for Texas, if you didn't know that, is friendliness. So I was also kind of overtly putting in one of our corporate values and it's also roughed up, right? It's not just a blue flat 
navy color on that logo. It's actually somewhat distressed and that's delivered as well. I wanted that to recognize our down to earth character, right? Really the biggest story in the logo is that there's a little Pentagon with 2010 inside of it. 2010, as I mentioned, is the year I wrote the business plan for the brewery. We're a little bit different. I built this brewery on my own. I own 100% of it. I don't know a penny to a bank or an investor or anybody. How I really look at that is, okay, I own this, my wife owns this, and my three kids own this. So the 2010 in there, the two represents me and my wife. The one is my firstborn daughter, Catherine, and then each of those zeros are the two twins, uh, Lola and Grace. So I put a lot about our family in there without being overt again. I think that's fantastic. A lot of times when people build the logo and the marketing identity for their company, what they really focus on is something hip, something cool, a friend who's a graphic artist, work something, logo up, and your logo has a lot of meaning. Do you tell that story You know, through when you gather at beer festivals and stuff, do you tell the story of the logo? Yeah, I mean, telling the story of our logo is telling about our brewery and what we're about, and every bit of that is very intentional, and I love talking about it. How do you as a leader share this vision and passion to the people you hire, and how do you make decisions about who you keep, who have become true believers versus people that are maybe just in for a paycheck, and they're a B-minus player, so you're like, I'm gonna upgrade and find someone who's a believer. How do you select the people that you're gonna allow to come in and how do you decide who you're gonna let stay? That's a great question um, because we handle that in a pretty unique manner. So the first year at the brewery, I worked there by myself. I brewed all the beer, I kegged all the beer, cellared all the beer, I delivered all the beer, I was the only rep, I did everything. One of the benefits of the brew industry is people love it, right? And I was getting these emails, tweets, you know, everything said, hey man, I'd love to come and see what the brewery's about and I'm happy to volunteer up some time. So I started having all these volunteers coming through and what this ended up ultimately being was this breeding ground of potential employees. So when it came time to hire my first employee, well, I didn't just post something on Craigslist and say, send me your resumes. I have all these great volunteers who are coming through here. These are guys who are volunteering their time. They already either love the product or love beer or love our brewery and they're there for a specific reason. So I harnessed that, right? And said, all right, let's utilize this pool. These people are all already in it. So when it came to hire that first guy, I just hired up one of my volunteers. And we basically continued down that same model for five plus years, hiring up volunteers only within the last year have we started to kind of go outside that pool um, because maybe we're a little bit more specialized now than we were on day one you know as day one one employee now we're at 30 employees but the way we started has provided us these hugely loyal employees that have understood what we're about how we operate what we want to do what our goals are understand the vision and are all in alignment with that right and as a result i mean we just don't hardly have people leave at all. That's fantastic. You know, they say every business plan is really three-year chapters because the five to seven-year plan now, that's good to set a vision out there, but good grief. I mean, the economy changes. So many things change in that amount of time. That three years is usually is this year, getting ready for next year, and then what we believe the next year is going to be. And a three-year bite is usually, you know, pretty good. As you look out right now at your next three years, what does it look like and what things are you doing to prepare? The brewery has changed so dramatically year after year that it is really difficult to say, oh yeah, this is what we're gonna be like in three years, five years. So, you know, I'm looking at 30 day plans. I'm looking at 90 day plans. I'm looking a year, I'm looking three years, Um, but there are definitely things that I'm looking at doing. And I would say first and foremost on that list is changing the law. I would definitely not say, hey, it's a really good idea to write a business plan that is based on you changing the law. Um, probably not a great idea, but you know, if you've got the passion and the know-how and the drive, you can make it happen. We've done it uh, on one occasion. We have another lawsuit that's pending before the Supreme Court and hope to win something there. But where I'm really focused right now is getting the right to sell beer on our premises to take with you, right? Come into our tap room, you find some beer that you like, buy it to take with you. Texas is the only state in the United States where you can't walk into a brewery and buy some beer to take with you. You're not talking about open container in my truck. You're talking about just like you can go into Napa and buy a case of wine and leave the winery. That's what people do, right? You go to Napa, you try these great wines, and you think, that was fantastic, I want to take some home. Here's a case. That's (laughs) right. It's a huge tourism draw, right? And so we have people still every day 
hey man, I'd like to buy this beer and take it home. Can you do that? No, you can't do that. But we do have a legislative session starting in uh, 2019, right? So we're putting our strategies together for that. I'm involved with the legislative committee for the Texas Craft Brewers Guild and I'm you know, putting a lot of time and effort into trying to get that law changed because if there's one thing that I wish, one right that I wish we had that we do not, it's that beer to go. Wow, and you know what? Depending on the industry you're in, you may have to change the law. Speaking of change, early on when you get out of college and you come home to the dream, my mom is now making beer, you know, the dream that most, I don't know if people have that dream, but that, that certainly would be something that would have lit me up in a positive way. When you first stepped into it, you're a trained lawyer, you've done all these things, and then you say, wow, I'm gonna have to learn this and this. So you were packing, you were distributing, you were brewing, you were doing a lot of things. But what things did you say, I have to add this skill to my repertoire, how did you do it in the midst of being all employees of your little starting brewing company, you, right. or everything? Well, first and foremost, you almost have to go in reverse a little bit. I mean, job one, beer quality beer, world-class beer, right? I mean, I was brewing beer at home in the backyard and that was one of the kind of the seeds for this entire brewery um, that has now come to fruition. With your I, mom's recipes. It, it, no, 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 it, by that time I was doing my own stuff and people were saying, oh man, this is awesome, I'm loving this, you know, this is great. But brewing at home in your backyard is still quite a bit different than operating a commercial brewery. So skill number one, man, mastering the brew process. I went to brew school. I enrolled with the American Brewers Guild and took their intensive brewing science and engineering program so that I could figure out how to scale up five gallon batches I was doing in my backyard to, you know, 500 gallons at a time because, you know, the brewmaster who I learned from said, man, the best thing you could do is make a great beer great every time. The next best thing you could do is make a terrible beer that's terrible every time. The worst thing you could do is make a beer that is sometimes good and sometimes bad. And that really struck a chord with me because I thought, yeah, that's true. Budweiser, it's the same. If I'm in Chicago or Boston or LA, New York, it doesn't matter. It's always the same. And so, yes, how do you make that beer so it's the same every single time, right? You know, that's key. I don't like those beers, those big brewers beers, but obviously there's a market for it. It's still 90% of the market, right? And that so, goes for any product. Any product you make, when you start working with subcontractors to make your product to scale your business, you want to make sure it's made the same everywhere, whether it's everywhere. beer or, you know, other food products, or it could be clothing. You want it to be the same. Yeah. So that was number one, quality beer. And what I've told my guys for, you know, five years, man, it's all about the beer. It's all about the beer. It's all about the beer. Now I should say that last year I changed it to, no, it's actually all about the people uh, because it was just me early on, right? And I was talking about me, but man, it's putting together that crew, finding a team that is really going to share in your vision because it is about the people. It's no longer me. I'm one of 30 people who are operating this thing. So you've got to get good people, right? And you've got to be someone who can find good people and understand how to cultivate good people and, you know, let them grow their wings and let them fly, give them some space, you know? So that, that's another big thing, you know? And then when you talk about what do you have to master, I knew I had to master everything that had to do with the law, right? Because that was a strength for me. So you want to utilize your strengths and minimize your weaknesses. So I was utilizing that strength of the law um, where I had a big weakness was marketing. Um, that was an area that I did not have um, the acumen that I might have now, um, but it's, a, it's just one of those other things. It's on that to-do list. Get better in this area. Identify what those areas are, get better at. So that's something that, oh yeah, we've had to grow leaps and bounds from when we started to where we are now. Who are the mentors in your life that taught you some of these important skills that you're calling on, pulling them out of the backpack, when you started this? I mean, the easy answer and the most obvious answer are, you know, both of my parents. Uh, they raised all three of their kids, me, my brother and sister, um, in such a manner as to be very independent. And so that served me well because when you have, you know, a relatively successful law firm and you tell people, oh yeah, I'm gonna open up this microbrewery and at a time where people are like, I don't even really know what that is, what are you doing? You've gotta, you know, aren't you doing okay as a lawyer here? You know, it takes a little bit of a leap of faith to make that jump, um, but to have that can do, gotta do, I'm gonna do this and to grow that confidence, it's something that they conveyed to me very early on in my life that, you know, is a big part of who I am today. Um, that's number one. And then number two, I went to University of Texas at Dallas and there was a professor there named Dr. Champagne. I never liked school. All through grade school, middle school, high school, my first foray into college, I didn't care for school, I didn't like school. Well, Dr. Champagne sat down in his course and a light 
turned on for me. It was the first time that I started to enjoy education and really understand the value of an education. And I was interning uh, for Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison, and the secretary there told me one day, she goes, you know, you can lose everything in life. You could lose your home, you could lose your spouse or your kids, you could lose your car, but there's one thing you can't lose. That's your education. Once you earn it, you've got it. And that hit me also. And I'm like, it is about education. And that's when I really started to realize, oh man, I can um, not only enjoy this, but excel at it. And it's what allowed me to get through school or undergraduate with grades that were, I guess, good enough to get into law school and then to, you know, excel in law school as well. So now you're coming up 2010, 2011. Is it, what, we're coming up seven, eight years now for Petacola's Brewery? So I brewed the very first beer on December 30th of 2011. So that's the start date that we use. So we will have our seven-year anniversary on December 30th of 2018 this year. Now we're going to talk about something a little more sensitive, if that's okay. Every entrepreneur that is watching is fearful of two things making a mistake or not making a mistake, and the market just doesn't accept it. You did everything right. There was nothing wrong with what you did. The market just doesn't accept it. Talk about what mistake did you make early on that you learned from and you're stronger for it? Minimizing those mistakes, and that is writing that business plan, right? You have gotta write that business plan before you ever get started because it's gonna really make you think about the most difficult decisions and make you really think, hey, is this gonna work or is this not gonna work, right? Or, or I um, thought about this and I planned for it. Yeah, that's exactly right. If you haven't planned for it, you're gonna have a tough go, right? I mean, you can come up with this idea and think, oh man, I've got this great idea, it's good, it's good. And if all you think about is the good stuff and don't really think about some of the threats, you're doing yourself a big disservice. I mean, I can remember saying, all right, there's no brewery in Dallas because a, either no one sees the opportunity, or B, there's just no market for it. And I think you're exactly right. You need to think about, before you ever start, you really need to think about, is there actually a market for it? That's huge. And that was something that ultimately I did my homework and thought, all right, I've done the research, I put in the time to write this plan, and my result is yes, there is a market for it. What about an operational or people mistake that you made in those first three, four years, when you go from these volunteers knocking on the door and say, I love what you're doing, I'd love to help out, and you had the volunteers that were becoming employees, what about an operational or people mistake you made in that zone and how that's made you stronger or what you learned from it? I welcome mistakes. I tell my crew, make mistakes. Don't be afraid of, ma of making mistakes because we're going to learn more from the mistakes than from the successes in a lot of cases. I make plenty of mistakes, go out there, make mistakes. You're free to make mistakes, go make mistakes. We're gonna learn from them and mistakes are made. Um, but what I've always said is it, it's not what happened. It's not the result of that mistake. It's how do you respond to it? It's not what happened to you. It's like, now what do you do? That's the more important aspect of it. Don't worry about that mistake. What are we going to do to fix it? That's what's more important because that has much more longevity to it. What about an individual that makes repetitive mistakes or it's just clear that it's time to say goodbye? What advice can you give to an emerging entrepreneur of how to say goodbye and how to process through that decision? That's a tough one for me personally. Um, again, I do things a little bit differently than well, I think the normal entrepreneur says, don't become personally connected with your employees. I've done just the opposite. I'm, I've become great friends with my employees. I've been to their weddings. I was out last Saturday, my brewer and I, we got together with our wives and went to dinner. So I become very heavily invested in my guys. I have a long rope. That leash is long. You can make mistakes, and if the mistakes are repetitive and repetitive, it's like, well, we've grown now, we've got other departments. Is there another department that you might be a better fit in? If you can't pull it here, would you be better off over here? Do you have the skills to do that? So for us, I wanna utilize the maximum skill that my guys have. And if some guy shows a deficiency in one area, but a benefit that we could use in another area, well, let's just move them over to that part of the organization. And that's worked for us. Now, that doesn't mean we have gotten rid of one employee. It's happened. If you have something that just doesn't work and doesn't work, I mean, you've got to cut it. You've got to let it go. Now, I probably let it drag on six months too long because I have this, no, we can rehabilitate, we can do better, we can do better. But what a lot of entrepreneurs would tell you is the first time you think about firing someone, fire them. Don't wait any longer. I've never really been of that mindset, um, but I can see why a lot of people would say that because if you just try to make something work 
and it doesn't, and you do that and do that and do that, at some point, you know, you're failing and you've got to make the change. When you look at business cycles, you've got multiple business cycles happen, you know, life stages go, come and go for a company. Yeah, but luck sometimes also plays a part. And sure. I, I kind of refer to it as luck and unintended consequences that I took advantage of. Can you give an example of just some luck or unintended consequences that happened, but you were prepared to take advantage of it, and that's why it turned out well? <laughs> you know, a lot of our overall success, I still attribute to luck, right? We, we've some people say you make your own luck, right? You put yourself in that position to get lucky. I opened up a brewery at a time where there wasn't any other breweries in Dallas. There were only two in North Texas. And ultimately I opened up, I was the second brewery in Dallas, but really only by a month. Someone else opened right before me, but it was lucky that I did open when I did because now fast forward to today, there's like 50 breweries in North Texas and starting brewery when I did is much different than trying to start one today. So I was lucky in terms of being able to identify all right, here's a good time for this to happen because if you wait now, when people call me up saying, hey, I'm looking at open up a brewery, I'm like, okay, that's cool and all, um, but we're really saturated now and it's not going to be the same for you as it is, you know, the people who are opening up five years ago and especially 10 years ago. You know, it sounds like you really have an amazing culture. You talked about only actually letting one person go in so many years, about carefully establishing yourself early on. You became a magnet for people who actually wanted to volunteer. So they came in and became part of what Michael was building. How do you establish that great culture today? Or, or better yet, how did you establish it and how do you maintain it today? It goes back to that business plan. If you've done a proper business plan, you've got, you know, when I talk to you about our logo, honest, friendly, down to earth, it's in there, but those are our corporate values, right? It was easy for me, very genuine. My family, when I was thinking about what should the values of this company be, I wanted it to be a very genuine thing. And I started thinking, what are the values for my family? And that's really what I came up with. I mean, it's about being honest. I don't care if you made a mistake, tell me about it, it's fine. I would rather you not lie about it and let's deal with the repercussions right. of what happened than lie about it and find out. So, and being friendly, that's a big part. I've always been friendly all my life. I love talking to people and down to earth. That's just who I am, you know, I don't try to be real showy. I don't really care about any of that stuff. So for me, developing those genuine uh, values we're a great place to start, right? Because you then can tell anyone else who's coming in here, yeah, this is what we're about. It was easy on for me to, you know, convey what our culture was and it was me just kind of one-on-one -on -one, and I was finding those guys, those early volunteers, those early employees that shared my values and were able to bring them aboard. They shared our values, they sure shared the vision of the company and then they slowly started imparting those same values to the next generation of employees that were coming on. So it's very important. I think culture may be, you know, I mentioned earlier that it was initially all about the beer, all about the beer, all about the beer and then finally I'm like no it's all about the people and culture is a huge part of it right you want this to be a great place to work you know when we started on day one you're the benefits were free beer you know so that was it <laughs> um, and it's like I listen to my guys all right so when it came time to get a health insurance plan we didn't get some rinky dink plan right we got a plan a plan that was good and the brewery pays two-thirds of the premium we still have the free beer so you've got that we have a 401k and we'll match 100% of your contribution up to 5% of your salary you want to make sure you're building a place that people want to work and will continue to want to work and are surrounded by other people that they enjoy that have like interest you know we it's kind of easy here for us because we're, we're all enjoying beer, you know, daily. Um, but we have other interests as well. And it's about, you know, when someone says, hey, I've got a best friend who's looking for a job, I'm thinking, perfect. He'll come in and want to make sure that, you know, you're going to look good for referring someone. He's going to be working harder. You're going to want to only refer people who are really going to be a fit for us. And it works. Culture is, is you know, probably the single most important thing at uh, any organization. Michael, what makes Petacola so special? What I've always told people is what we deliver, what we brew is world-class passion in a glass. And the reason I use the term world-class is I can remember a brewery who came out and said, hey, we've got the best IPA in Texas. And I thought, well, says who? We use the term world-class passion in a glass. World-class is specific because the Great American Beer Festival, if you're an actor, you want to win an Oscar. If you're a brewer, you want to win a gold medal at the Great American Beer Festival because what that denotes is that you are making world-class beer. And we've not only won that once, we've won it twice. Fantastic, so that is the Academy Award in the brewing industry. That's it. And you've got two. Well, here's to and two And a silver. Those.
and a silver. <laughs> so, and a best supporting actor, I suppose. <laughs> That's right. Cheers. So, Michael, if people wanted to check it out, maybe it wasn't on a tap handle at their favorite brewery. How can they come check you out, your company, and sample some of this great beer? Yeah, so the brewery that we built is right in the Dallas Design District, just right off of downtown. We've got a tap room connected to the brewery. You can see the brewery. We pour 18 beers on tap. Come on in. Check out our brewery. You'll have a ball. If you visit Dallas or live here, come pay us a visit. Michael, this has really been a lot of fun. I'm going to ask you one more question, and that is, Coming up to your seventh year, eighth year, uh, your seventh year anniversary in December, then you're going to be your, you're going into your eighth, ninth year as you look forward. What are you looking at differently now than when you built that first business plan? The first business plan was it's all about the beer, get the product right, get some early distribution partners, et cetera. What kind of things are you looking at right now as the 10 year anniversary is just three years out. Yeah, you know, you're always looking for ways to grow your business, whether you're adding products or another line altogether. I mean, we opened up a retail tap room. Our goal has never really changed. And what I've told people from day one is we don't want to be big, we want to be great. And that's what it's about. I think that's fantastic. Well, I thank you very much for coming and sitting with us on a beer and business. We hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you took some notes and got something out of it. And I'm Tom Mills with the BizDoc, and I hope I left you better than I found you. Thanks for watching this episode. I hope you like the new beer and business set because we're listening to you and we want to make it better every week. I also want to know who do you think should be sitting in the chair next to me to be interviewed to bring kernels of wisdom to entrepreneurs around the world? You can reach out to me in the comments below or Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. They all just showed up on screen. Until next time, I'm Tom Elser with the BizDoc. I hope I left you better than I found you, and I'm always listening.